Benares, the sacred city on the crest shore of the holy Ganges River. I floated slowly up and down alone. Guru had been taken ill on the long journey back to the Festival of Horrors. The human Buddhist, this spot has the same meaning as Jerusalem has for the Christian and the Jew. Forty-seven stone ghats, each dedicated to a different god, extend for several miles above and below the places where... The Countless pilgrims, some well and strong, others sick and dying, journey thousands on in never-ending waves in the filthy but purifying water of Mother Ganges, as they lovingly call the river. Many chill themselves into death. They come here with the actual purpose of dying, for death here is preferable to life elsewhere. For Benares, they believe, is 60 feet nearer to heaven than any other spot on earth. Yet there's never contagion or epidemic though they violate every rule of health and sanitation. But that doesn't matter, says the devout Hindu, for nothing can defile Mother Ganges, no matter how foul. She purifies both sin and disease instantly and utterly. Slowly, the knowledge came to me that to these sincere believers, this river is a great cathedral. These stone steps are their views. I realize now that the washing of this cool water against their fevered skins is to them more beautiful than any heavenly choir. The water must be dipped in a certain manner and allowed to trickle through the fingers before drinking. Certain prayers must be said at the same time. And nowhere on earth is there a river which so completely justifies the worship and devotion of a people. I began to believe that the dirtier a thing is, the holier it becomes in India. Here are seen many vivid demonstrations of the power of mind over matter. Yet, there is here some mysterious force, so mighty and powerful that it actually heals. The sight of these people bathing and drinking in this scum-covered water, amid seeping sewage and the charred portions of bodies which float down from the burning ghats, left me in a jumble of confusion. So I rowed my boat shoreward to try and remove the impression from my mind in the picturesque streets of the merchants. I came to the shops in the bazaars occupied by workers in gold, silver, and brass. Thousands of beautiful objects are made here by hand in the most exquisite designs. Damaskine, silver and gold inlay, is done by a secret process handed down from father to son. It was while here that I learned of a tragedy which affected me deeply. The old guru, who had been my constant companion since the day I engaged him, through whose kindly understanding I had learned so much of these people and their gods, was dead. The messenger quickly led me to the spot where the last rites for my guru were being held. The burning ghat on the Ganges. It is the daily prayer of a hundred million human beings that they be burned on this very spot. I saw the ghastly smoke of several corpses rising slowly into the air. Other bodies wrapped in winding sheets of gauze awaited their turn in the destroying flames. This untouchable belongs to a family who for six generations have. Behind him is the well where lepers bathe and where the water is changed but once a year. A sickly pall of smoke hung over the entire gap. One poignant thought came to my mind. The cheapest things in India are the lives of human beings. When I came to the place where my dead friend was to be cremated, he had already been given his last bath in the Ganges. Without that, the hands of untouchables who must care for him now would convey impurity. His nearest relative must sprinkle him with palm oil to hasten the action of the flames. In this climate, mortal remains must be disposed of at once. A man dies, an hour later he is ashes. As I gazed upon the rigid countenance of my guru, I wondered into what reincarnation his kindly soul had passed. Was he nearer that nirvana which all true Hindus desire to attain? With the slightest sign of emotion, she touched the sacred fire to the guru's throat. I knew nothing of the dead man's family, for he had never spoken of her. Was she, this young girl, the guru's daughter? Or was she his wife? If she was, I didn't want to know, for the fate of the Hindu widow is a sad one. She can never marry again. She must spend the rest of her existence in mourning for her lord and master. 
She must go through life as the slave of her dead husband's relatives. It is only a short time since Hindu wives committed suti, hurled themselves into the cremation fire of their husbands. Though suti is now forbidden by law, it sometimes happens. No wonder these little wives would rather die than face the miserable lives that await them. The flames leap viciously upward, enveloping, consuming. An untouchable used a long pole to make it burn faster. Behind me, I could hear the chant of other funeral processions. Life, existence, love, death. What does it all matter? You are never so dead as when you die in India. This was all earthly that was left of my guru. An earthen jar, a few poor ashes, and Mother Ganges performs the final rite herself, takes back to her bosom the remains of her son, and Hindus bathe and pray and drink. So life passes on in India. The Vale of Kashmir is a place of fairy-like loveliness. Kashmir. There is magic even in the name. To me, this is the most beautiful spot in all India. Here is one of the far-flung valleys of the world which has always called to me in my hours of dreams. It is here in the principal city, Srinagar, that the Maharaja has his summer palace. Srinagar is often referred to as the Venice of India on account of its many beautiful waterways. Many Indian families live and carry on their entire existence on the water in great houseboats like this. It's a great life. When you get tired of living in one spot, you simply untie the boat and move. Some of these boats are floating hotels. Here in Kashmir is a spot famed in the poems and songs of every people who have a written language, Shalimar Gardens. This incomparable garden was built by a great Mughal emperor for his beloved wife. Here was one oriental whose regard for woman transcends that of all his fellow Indians. Who indeed does not know the Kashmiri song, based upon the poem of Lawrence Hope? This is the spot which inspired that undying melody. Strange how so many of the loveliest things in the world have been made by some man or some woman. For Shalimar, strange exotic, lovely, passionate, put you in that ecstatic frame of mind. And in the grove of china trees which bordered Shalimar, I met a lovely little Kashmiri maiden. Perhaps she was lonely, just as I was. Perhaps she was merely curious. At any rate, she was probably as flattered by the attention of a white man as I was by the beauty in her big brown eyes. She wanted to walk toward home, but I had a better idea. I told her I wanted to look at birds and butterflies, and as she couldn't understand me, she believed me.
If you must go to Delhi, my friends warn me, wait until the Ramadan is over. It'll be safer then. So, I went to Delhi. I arrived there on the first day of Ramadan, the holy fast of a month. During this long holiday, the Mohammedan touches no food between dawn and dark. The bazaars are crowded. This season corresponds to our own religious holidays. Mohammedans have come here from all over India, for Delhi is the greatest Muslim religious center of the country. I wanted to see the spectacle of Ramadan, not as a white man, but from the Muslim viewpoint. There was but one way to do this. I disguised myself as a Mohammedan. I passed through streets that were rapidly empty. Ramadan was about to begin. All roads led to the great mosque. For fear of being recognized as an infidel, I dared not go through the great gate, but sought the darker passages through a labyrinth of dim corridors. I dared not wash in the pool as the others were doing. In the first place, it wasn't any too clean. Besides, I was afraid the water might remove the stain with which I covered my face and hands. I found another passage and noted it carefully, in case I should have to get away in a hurry. This led me through a vaulted corridor into another part of the court, where I thought I would be safer because it was less crowded. The great mosque at Delhi is one of the most majestic and beautiful temples in the world. It was built by Shah Jahan, who knew and loved beauty. Red sandstone and black and white marble offer odd contrasts. The faithful had unfurled their prayer rugs and ranged themselves in long rows for the first prayer. They waited only the call of the muezzin on the high balcony of the minaret. Then came his cry, loud and clear as a bell. Twenty thousand bodies bowed as one. Twenty thousand foreheads touched the hot stones of the courtyard. Twenty thousand people murmured the reply to the muezzin and rose to their feet. Twenty thousand souls acknowledged the majesty of Allah and the power of his prophet. It was indescribably impressive. I'm not of a particularly religious bent of mine, but the sight of that great spectacle thrilled me. The wish to be nearer God, the desire to worship him, the countless prayers of all these people were rising in a mighty symphony. It filled me with a deep and reverent feeling that I shall never forget. Allah be praised. Allah is the one God, and Muhammad is his prophet. That was their simple, understandable creed. I knew if they caught me, I hadn't a chance. Paradise is promised to the Muslim who kills an infidel who has committed sacrilege, and I was guilty. I was a Buddhist and helped me get away. Thus, I left the mosque by the back door. Later that evening, I discovered that New York and Paris haven't a monopoly on nightclubs. The cafe I visited had a floor show that wouldn't have looked out of place in any musical comedy. I could almost believe that I was back on Broadway or that the entire ensemble of the Follies had been imported here. 
That idea was only shattered when I saw the pit of this all-night resort. The place catered to every race and type which makes up the polygot population of an Indian city. They shouted encouragement to the dancers and flung coins to the musicians. The dances performed by these girls are adapted from the temple dances of the Devi Davas, girls of pleasure as they are called. Beginning with a slow rhythm, they reached a climax in a flashing whirl of speed which left the observer dizzy. The girls then mingled with the patrons at the tables. I noticed nearby several young Englishmen and their beautiful companions. Their language seemed to be perfect, but they, they didn't appear to be English girls. I asked my host, a wealthy young Hindu, about them. He said that the girls were half-castes, Eurasians. The living result of what happens when a love affair occurs between a Hindu woman and a white man. Most of the dancers were Eurasians also. That same white man who sheds tears over the plight of Madame Butterfly ruthlessly deserts a Eurasian girl and he turns his back on India and sails for home. What becomes of the girls? They go on with this life, while youth lasts, in the vain hope that they may sometime marry a white man. It was while here that my Indian friend asked me if I would enjoy going on a lion hunt. I thought he was joking, as I had never heard of lions in India. But he assured me he was in earnest. Lions still exist in considerable numbers in the Gear Forest. They are royal game and jealously guarded. But an attempt was to be made to capture an Indian lion for the private zoo of a wealthy Raja. The night club was going in full swing when we left. I didn't even stop for equipment, as I was told there would be plenty at our destination. Next day, we traveled to the Raja's hunting lodge by elephant. The Raja had a stable of these royal beasts, perfectly trained and groomed. My friend told me of an ancient proverb which typifies India. The poor have no friends, but the elephant waits at the rich man's door. I was exceedingly thrilled, for the lion hunt was to take place on elephants. This beast we were riding would be the one we would use in the hunt. And the unusual spectacle I was about to witness was to be one I would never forget. The people who were to be our beaters in the hunt were religious thieves. They are born criminals and so recorded in state police records at birth. As India has more gods than any other country, she also has more criminals. There are 15 million of them in India. They call themselves crows and hope to return to earth after death in the form of crows. They worship that bird of ill omen because they consider him a clever thief. Wickedness is their only creed in religion. The crow must do his evil deed each day. There is only one sin in the eyes of the crow, that of getting caught in the act of crime. In that case, the bull can only atone by getting drunk. The more he beats his wife, the better his chance of absolution. 